In preparation for the sermon this morning, I couldn't help but think about the incident that just occurred a few days ago as the Muslims were making their way to the Mecca. And it is reported that numerous lives were lost, up to maybe a thousand people perished uh, due to the extreme conditions in that particular region, the heat and uh, other issues. Now, I would say that with sorrow we weep, not just over the death, but the cause of it, the reason why they died. And the cause of it has to do with a God who is none other than the devil, uh, who would lead people a throng to uh, their, their height of annual worship before God who is satanic and evil. Uh, in our passage this morning, it's quite different. That is, the psalmist expresses his love for God's people and his love as he is walking his way to the place of worship, that he finds that there's strength that he gains in this pilgrimage. That those who worship God are led from life to life, and not from life to death. There's also a very important contribution he makes in this psalm, and it is the joy of public worship the joy of corporate gathering. And it is not just because the building is attractive as the temple may have been, but that God is there, that he will meet his people there in this place of worship. And as he anticipates this time, there's just more joy and more strength he finds as he meditates on worshiping God. I want you to turn with me to the 84th Psalm, Psalm 84. This is one of the great psalms of the many great psalms. If you've ever, ever read through this, and I just recollect one sister who is with the Lord now, I was just told that when I started preaching the psalms off and on on Sunday evenings when we gathered, that she hated the psalms. She couldn't stand the psalm until God brought her to the bed of affliction. This psalm is rich because the psalmist is transparent. Uh, the Lord inspired this psalm and encouraged the psalmist to be truthful about his struggles and to be honest about his weakness and to be transparent about the affliction. That in the midst of great affliction, that there's great mercy when the rivers of our complaint before God are overwhelming, it seems that God still hears graciously and responds in mercy. Psalm 84 is probably a, a follow-up to the 42nd and the 43rd Psalm. And if you ever read that Psalm, it's a Psalm of sadness, but also hope. And I just want to maybe I'll go over a few verses in that psalm for you so that you can see that the psalmist did not remain in this low and depressed and discouraged state. He says, as the deer pants for the water brooks in Psalm 42, so my soul pants for your God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember and I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with the sound of a shout of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival. So he recollects and he goes back to a point in time of great joy and excitement, but that's not happening now. For whatever reason, he's not able to do this, and he's saddened over the fact that he cannot worship the same way he used to. Uh, but then he says in verse 5, Why are you in this spirit of my soul, and why are you disturbed within me? Wait for God, or as other translations will say, Hope in God, for I shall still praise him for the salvation of his 
presence. At the end of Psalm 43, it is the same. Why are you in despair, O my soul, and why are you disturbed within me? Wait for God, for I shall still praise him, the salvation of my presence and my God. Well, this hope and despair lights up in Psalm 84. Because in Psalm 84, there is a sincere joy of worshiping with God's people. And uh, to, to outline this psalm, you have three statements of how blessed, or how blessed, if you want to use that. The outline is very simple in verse 4. It is how blessed are those who dwell in your house. This is a profound blessing, because not everyone dwells in it. And at this point in time, not everyone wants to be in it, but it's the grandest place to be on the Lord's Day on the Sabbath for them under the Old Covenant. It's to be in the house of Yahweh. And then the second outline is verse 5. How blessed is the man whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. And then the third point to this psalm is in verse 12. And it says, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. Let us read the entire psalm together. Psalm 84 for the choir director, according to the Gittith of the sons of Korah, a psalm. How lovely are your dwelling places, O Yahweh of hosts, my soul has long then even fainted for the courts of Yahweh. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the bird has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself. Where she sets her young at your altars, O Yahweh of hosts, my King and my God. How blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Selah. How blessed is the man whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways of Zion, or to Zion. Passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The early rain also wraps it up with blessings. They go from strength to strength. Each one of them appears before God in Zion. O oh, Yahweh, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O oh, God of Jacob. Selah. See our shield, O oh God, and look upon the face of your anointed. For better is a day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would choose to stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For Yahweh God is a sun and a shield. Yahweh gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk blamelessly. O Yahweh of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. Now, during my reading of this psalm, I pray that you recognize the center of attention, the oft mention of Yahweh of hosts, the God of his salvation, his king and his God, O God of Jacob. That worship center is not around an event. It centers on God himself. True worship, Biblical worship, the worship that God designed, has God as its focus, God as its aim. The worship of Yahweh as its goal, Jesus Christ, the head of the church, as its objective. All of the forms of worship are outside of God's intention. And so if our songs and our mention in the preaching centers on humanity, it is no longer a worship of God, it is a worship of man. If our preaching centers 
strictly on how you can have a better today for a better tomorrow personally and not the glory of God. It is no longer true biblical worship. If our worship and preaching corporately or personally is always fixated on the personal benefit we derive from it, it is no longer the worship that God ordained in creation and our salvation. You can see that in this psalm. That the loveliness of God's place of worship just evokes, induces, stirs this, this love and this passion for God himself, who is the center and the focal point of the corporate gathering. To the psalmist, for example, when he says, how blessed are those who dwell in your house, in verses 1 through 3, he explains what it means to be blessed. To be blessed is to be able to express with joy that you enjoy being with God and his people. That is verse 1, that there's a sense of, of, of this affection, this, this, this passion, this desire to be with God's people exclusively because God is there. Maybe you and I remember as young people growing up, we enjoyed certain aspects of corporate worship, but didn't always enjoy the God of corporate worship. You don't have to admit it, but you probably enjoy being with your friends. Well, why do you like going to church? Your first answer may be, or may have been at that time, because my friends are there. Because I get to, haven't seen them in a week, I can't drive to see them, but now my parents have to drive me to see my friends. They have no choice. So my friends will be there. This is going to be a great time. The psalmist says that it is because of God. We enjoy corporate worship because of God. There's great delight because of God. Now, the psalmist in Psalm 42 and 43 did talk about the benefits, though, of being with God and his people because there's an invigorating effect. There's the stirring of, of joy of love, of this sense of excitement for God when you're with like-minded people. When you are in the world and you're uh, equating yourself with the world because you work, you have a job, whatever it may be, the world is not excited about corporate gatherings. They're not excited about the Lord's Day. The unbelieving world is opposed to this moment. So there's, there's a sense on a secondary level due to our love for Christ and our corporate agreement in Christ and our unity in him that there is a sense in which we love to be with God's people, but it is never more important than being with God. The psalmist says it is lovely, either meaning that he loves it or just in its most natural form, wherever God is, it is always good. It is always something to cherish. It is always something to find great joy and gratitude over. There's nothing more lovely than being with the beloved. In verse 2, how blessed are those who dwell in your house. Verse 4 is explained in verse 2 once more. It is, you know you're blessed when there's a longing. In verse 2 of the psalmist, it's not using hyperbole just to exaggerate a point, but he's showing you just how much he loves being with God and his people. He's saying nothing compares to it. So the longing in verse 2 and the fainting are expressions of someone's deepest desire. You cut him open and you'll see, I love God and corporate worship. I love Yahweh and the fellowship of the saints. You cut a saint who knows it's blessed to be with God's people, and you will see the word of God, and you will see the worship of God, and you will see the people of God. Those who are blessed, who dwell in his house, love the scripture. They love corporate gathering, and they love God's people. This is a, a critical assertion to the common arguments of men and women who say that they, they love God, but they don't love the church. Or churches are planted for people who hate the church. Uh, according to the psalmist, that's not possible. You're probably cursed, not blessed. To, to despise the church, 
And listen, I know the church consists of fallen people, right? We are all redeemed sinners. And we all contribute to this pot of redeemed sinners, and we bring into the pot what? We bring into the pot what? Sin. That God is slowly but surely sanctifying. And some, it is progressive. All it is progressive, some it is progressively slow. And so we're all in this community together, and we all have to bear up with this together. But it is a blessing and a glory to overlook a fault because we are blessed just to even be here. Just to even have the, the desire to come. Just even the inkling to, to want to drive and to show up and to attend. That in and of itself is a glorious blessing. But the psalmist goes beyond that. And in the midst of the sin and the prevailing sin and the struggles and the issues that may be in the corporate worship, he still longs to be with God's people and he's fainting, he says. His entire being is a reference to the point and at the end of verse 2, my heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. He's saying that with everything that is in me, I am praying to the God who's the source of my life and my salvation. And this, I think, is such a crucial correction when we allow circumstances or events to affect our concentration on God and our longing to worship God. That when you have bad butterflies in your belly, as you attend corporate worship, it is an indictment that the heart is not truly tuned to the one person who makes worship effective no matter what is happening. It is God himself. It is this love for Christ, this love for the triune God, this knowledge of the Savior that enables us as God's people to worship under every condition because we know no matter what happens, God promises to be there. The psalmist says, how blessed are those who dwell in your house because when you think that way, when you live that way, you see the place of God as lovely, as glorious. You, you long to be with God's people. And then the psalmist makes an analogy in verse 3 that even the bird has found a home. That even this bird that escapes from the outdoors found a haven in the place of worship. And he doesn't take that for granted as he's looking and as he's seen the, the, the bird entering this open area and finds a place to rest. The psalmist is amazed at that, that even the birds are in this sacred and rich place of worship. And one commentator said that the swallow in verse 3 was a symbol of restlessness. But the place of worship has now become a place of rest. I think that is true, even for the Christian, right? The pace of life, the schedules in our day are so filled, so pressed in. For, I don't know, for some reason, we equated busyness with godliness. But every day, there's something to do, an event to see, a place to go. And even the parents with young kids, it's astonishing that they can't even take one day off to glory in salvation. There's always something to do, somewhere to go, someone to see. The pace in our age is frantic. And that is why we're tempted to go 85 and a 55 because we have no time to drive safely but to die on our way to the destination. We are in a frantic world, a hectic world. Sunday is a haven. It is a rest. It is a Sabbath rest. And that is a foretaste of the future Sabbath rest to come for all eternity. Am I saying that the saints ought not uh, to participate in events and go to the park and 
run around and play sports. If I say that, then you know I'm a liar because I've done it before. But Sunday is sacred, set apart for God and his people. That the soul finds rest when we slow down and remember the gospel of our salvation. When we sit down and say, well, you know what? My checklist was incomplete this week, but I know that I'm complete in Christ. Yes, I didn't get everything accomplished. I wasn't the hero of the day of the week, but my trust does not rest in my achievements because Christ has accomplished my salvation. We slow down just enough to realize that self-righteousness will condemn and damn us, but we must trust in the righteousness of Christ for us. For the restless heart that thinks that busyness is a virtue, and in your busyness, you fail to spend time in the Word of God. Your prayers were everywhere and nowhere at the same time. You don't remember what you said 30 seconds ago to God. Everything is rushed and frantic, and even... When you pray, it is either brief or heartless because something else is on your mind. This is a day that we can hit the reset button and look at our lives and examine our affections for Christ and see what has gone wrong. Says, Are we truly thinking along these lines? That is really, do you not know how blessed you are that you are here? See, the psalmist is making this statement from the standpoint of the goodness of God. This blessing is not of us. Left to ourselves, we would rather attend this moment infrequently if left to our own desires. But the blessing of corporate worship comes from God. I think we can see this from the world's point of view. If they knew that this was as good as the scripture claims, you think they will be there and not here? Do you think they will actually spend the whole day at the beach and get caught in the rip current and stand before just and the holy God to find out they've wasted their entire lives and rebelled against his son? Do you actually think that if they knew the benefits of corporate gathering, that they would actually waste their whole weekend like, they spend seven days a week doing nothing. I, mean, I, can't, I don't know about you, I cannot imagine not being with God's people on a corporate Sunday. I, I, it, I can't imagine, I don't want to imagine it. You mean to tell me that you will choose the ocean over the overflowing tide of God's Son on the Lord's Day? I can't imagine So to emphasize the point here, you are really blessed to actually see the benefits of corporate worship because it is beneficial, but the world, the masses, are blind to it. How blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Here's a story, and I read it from a commentator who said that one of his members would complain about sitting through an entire service. Now, I don't want to give you personal history, but our services back in the day were about three and a half hours. <laughs> give you some context. Here you get out by 12-ish, depending on the preacher. I've been working on him for about 10 years to cut it at 12, but he's not always obedient. Three and a half hours. And so this member said to the pastor, I just cannot sit down in these pews for a long time. It, it just does something to me. I cannot physically endure a service sitting down. And so the pastor was on his way, striving, and he sees this unfortunate member sitting at the side of the pool. And so the first thought that came to the pastor's mind is that there must be something really good about this seat. 
for him to sit down for well over three hours and not feel uncomfortable. So the pastor wanted to know what is in this particular chair that encourages this member, because if he wants to help the member, he might have to get you know, a lazy boy in the, the congregation to help this guy. He walks up and notices that the chair that they were using was an old pew seat without the cushion. It's not about endurance. It's not about the services being long. It's not even about the preacher being long-winded, although I know a few of them, yours truly notwithstanding. It's not about the longevity of the sermon. It's about the heart. Now, sermons should not be deadly long. Eutychus is a great example of that in Acts. We're not here to kill the saints. We're here to encourage them as they're dying naturally. But it's not the length of the sermon. There's a reasonable point of time where the sermon has to, yes, we have to conclude the sermon. But that's not the issue. The issue is the heart. The issue is the heart of this person loving and longing to hear what God has to say. If that were not the case, then tell me how is it possible to sit through 100 degrees of intense heat and watch men in tights run around with a football like oversized ballerinas? How is it possible for us to endure hours long of a movie? Don't tell me about your all-nighters, ladies. When you watch the movie or show and it has a sequel, and there are more sequels on top of sequels, and now it's a series. What did you do? I couldn't walk away. I mean, every part of your body is as numb as death is. And you sit through it, you wiggle, you squirm, you move around, you exercise, you dance, you do something, and you endure it for a night. So it's really not about the length of anything it is the love of everything but God. It is not that the event of preaching is too long or corporate worship is too long. We meet too often. It is that the longing is absent. The psalmist says, how blessed are those who dwell in your house. This is a tremendous blessing. Now, I would say it does have to be stirred. We have to stir this affection through prayer and the word of God because the natural mind is not always inclined to it. But then the second part of this outline is that it says that those whose strength is in you, they're blessed. Think about this. Where does the strength come to attend worship and to be engaged and alert? No, no matter how many hours of sleep you have the night before, the rest is critical to being alert. The psalmist says strength comes from God, and this is where they need the strength. They need the strength on the pilgrimage. They're, they're walking, they're journeying, and you could be exhausted and tired. It's not that the psalmist is saying, hey, we don't drink any water. This is a supernatural event. We don't drink any water. We want to eat. No, that's not the point he's making. He's saying, though, that we receive strength from God in the pilgrimage that we don't even complain, but we give thanks. We're ever rejoicing as we make this long walk to the corporate place of worship. This is not for everyone a walk around the block as the Jews were being scattered and living in other places. This is not um, centralized in Jerusalem. No, worship still surrounded Jerusalem, but yet they had to make a trek. They had to make a journey. It wasn't always brief. It, some of them were long. And yet he's saying that we go from strength to strength. And even as they're walking through this parsed area in Baca, which was not always fertile, they will still see evidence of God's goodness by finding areas where water is still present in the midst of a parsed land. Everything was attributed to God's goodness, even in the midst of famine or desert. Now fast forward, here we are. We're like in the 21st century. We've got cars and We've got bikes, and we've got motorcycles, we've got transportation, almost more than one means of transportation. So what's happening on that drive to worship? What are you thinking about as you're driving? What, what are your thoughts? Are you distracted 
by the world or you're attracted to the beauty of worshiping God together. There's some families to make sure that they are intentional in worship will frame the drive to corporate worship as a way to prepare for it. They will sing songs. They will speak God's word to each other. The longing for worship doesn't come when the doors are open. It is cultivated throughout the week of personal worship with God, even more so for those of us who are in Christ. The Old Testament saints, the tabernacle or the temple was symbolic of God's presence. That's not the case for us. God dwells in us richly through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's always present with us. He's always there. Always there. And so on the journey to the place of worship, are we complaining about the weather? Are we complaining about the drivers? No, are we complaining about the driver next to us who needs to drive better? If you have a spouse whose air brakes are highly functional, you know what I mean. Or are we rejoicing in God? Are we giving thanks to God? Are we remembering our salvation? And while everyone else is weaving out of traffic, heading wherever they're going, we get off the exit, we get off the street, and we find a place to worship where God's people expect to hear from him. God's people find the greatest delight in his presence, and there is something sacred and even more glorious when we gather together. There's strength when we gather together than when we are apart. So there's saints, there should be this, this anticipation, this sense of excitement, this sense of, okay, I, I am preparing to meet with God. May I prepare my heart to meet with him. Even the exhausted in verse 5 find strength for worship because it comes from Yahweh. They're not angry. They're not frustrated. They're not complaining. The path to worship is filled with praise. It is filled with the power of God. And it is filled with thanksgiving. And even if you look at this text in verses 5 through 7, that they're making the most out of the journey by setting their minds on things above. That's what Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, that is, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. If you're always looking horizontally at what is half right or half wrong with this world, you will never be encouraged. But when you set your mind on Christ and you focus your thoughts on him and uh, you, you remember his atonement for your salvation and you consider the depth of his love for the depth of your sin. If you remember how merciful he is to the undeserving and, and how good he is to those who are evil toward him, you see yourself standing in the light of his grace and you give thanks. So life for the worshiper is effective when it is vertical. It is effective when it is vertical. And they're saying there's so many issues in our world today. Over the last 15 to 20 years, you can die talking about the issues in our world. They're saying that we may even be approaching a global war. Russia was just on Florida's coast, close to Florida's coast, just outside of Cuba. They're partnering with North Korea and Vietnam. I mean, we, we could very well witness this in our lifetime. But if you fixate your eyes on that, you will lock your doors, jam your doors, close your blinds, sell your car, you will buy processed food that will last for six years because you will shut yourself up in the world due to fear. But if you look at this text, they realize that whether it's the, the puddle of water on the ground or the bird nesting in the temple that the sovereign God is exercising complete control from one end of the earth to the next. That we as his people ought not to be in fear for any reason at all because God is our strength. He is our shield. 
He is the one exercising his rightful authority over all his creation. So what should happen on Monday morning to the saint as we gather for worship and or we leave worship and we're with the world? We should be relaxed. We should be rested. We should be satisfied, should we not? We should be content. We should be joyful. Did you not hear what happened yesterday? Yes, I heard. But let me tell you something better. That the scripture says that all things were created by him. That he's the head of all things. He's the sustainer of all things. So when I see what is happening under the sun, I'm always looking to the S-O-N, not through the lenses of the S-U-N. That Christ rules supremely. That is the settled conviction of the Christian. That we're not disturbed to the point of despair when we see what is happening around us because we are grounded in the very nature of our sovereign God. When he says that this Yahweh is Yahweh of hosts, uh, the Lord of the Sabbath, oh, Lord of the armies, we sang the song today, he's a mighty fortress. Dear saints, we know this is true. I, I must repeat it. There's absolutely nothing in this world that escapes the power of God. Nothing. If they launch a nuclear bomb and it has your address on it, there is nothing that it can escape the power of God. I mean, what an explosive way to go home to glory, right? I mean, he's going to really have to recreate this body. He's going to have to start all over again. Yes, <laughs> please start over. This mirror tells me a lot more than I need to see. Nothing happens apart from the ultimate authority of your sovereign God. Nothing. Nothing. That is why the psalmist can say, do you know how blessed you are when you know that your strength comes from him and your help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth? And the psalmist says that he will not suffer your foot to be moved, that the Lord who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. That's your God. Every other God is either dead or sleeping. But this God is always present, active, working all things according to the counsel of his will. The path to worship is filled with praise, power, and thanksgiving. And then in verses 8 and 9, it's a part of this second outline of blessed are those whose strength is in you. He prays to God, hear my prayer. And in this moment, he's interceding for the king. He's interceding for those who lead. Look upon the face of your anointed, oh, your appointed king, is what we believe he's saying here. That he's not trusting in the armor of the king, the king's righteousness, or the king's might. He's trusting in God alone to guide the king, to direct the king, to strengthen the king. But then the third blessed is the end of verse 12. How blessed is the man who trusts in you. How is that seen? I would argue it's seen from verses 10 and 11. For better is a day in your course than a thousand elsewhere. I would choose to stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. The psalmist clearly articulates what Psalm has been saying. That those who love God and who are blessed, they do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. They do not stand in the way of sinners or sit at the seat of the scornful, but they delight in God's word, God's law. The psalmist makes that distinction once more. You know someone who trusts in Yahweh is that they find that being with God and his people is always supremely more important, even if it's at the threshold of the front door, even if it's just the entrance, than to enjoy the successes from this world. He'd rather be poor and broken 
not have the privilege that some may have, if it means being with God and his people, nothing gets in the way of this affection. But here the tense of wickedness may not just be wicked people, but it could be those who are wealthy or successful. And there may be a temptation for some to say, well, you know what, I'm not necessarily fellowshipping with this unbeliever, but I'm trying to network with him. But in networking with this unbeliever, it comes at a tremendous cost. You're trying to, to gain access to this wealthy or influential personality, it comes at the lessening of your conviction. In other words, you can't say what you should say. You can't say what you must say in their presence. You must say less. So now Yahweh is the man upstairs. It can't be Jesus Christ. It has to be God or something general. You begin to use religious lingo because you cannot upset this wealthy or influential ungodly person. The psalmist says, like Peter, you and your money perish. Because the things of God, this, this glory of worship cannot be bought with money. Do you know that this was bought by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Who redeemed me to the point where I actually love being with God and his people? The psalmist says no. He takes the position that Paul so clearly warns God's people, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with the Lyle? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has a sanctuary of God with idols? For we are the sanctuary of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you. And you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. The psalmist, as Paul says here, he's not at home for any reason with the ungodly. He's not comfortable with their conversations. He's not comfortable with their invitations. He's not comfortable with anything that they do because he delights in God. Now just a quick, I think, pause on that. In no way are we saying that you are so separate that you don't have conversations with them. But the point here is fellowship with a level of comfort. You should never be comfortable with your own sins or the sins of the world. You should never be comfortable with, with off-color jokes or cold and harsh statements. You should never be comfortable with gossip in the workplace. You should never be comfortable with slander in the workplace. It doesn't matter if he is the owner of the business. You graciously appeal to him, and if he doesn't listen, you walk away. Because you enjoy Yahweh more than the tents of wickedness. The scripture says, uh, that six things the Lord hates, if you recall that in Proverbs and seven are an abomination to him, one of them includes lying lips. Those who spread slander. There's one thing to hate, and there's nothing but an abomination. The two are true of God. He hates it to the point where it's an abomination. And we put our speeches and our words and our tongue harshly on others. God hates it, but then he says it's an abomination to him. This is not some light matter. This, this is a Christian cherishing Yahweh more than the conversation that may produce a promotion in this earth, but then grieving the Spirit of God. The psalmist finds it best to worship with the few than to indulge in sin with the many. Or in the words of Matthew Henry, it is better to be serving God alone than serving sin with a multitude. I mean, that's one of the defining marks, I would say, of the Christian life. It is this, this separateness from sinners. And it is not, here's the key, it's not isolation from sinners. 
So there's a difference between isolation and separation. It is that your language, your thoughts, your desires are so distinct. They're just different because they're heavenly. They're from above. So your conversations become more and more, as you grow in Christ, they become more and more distinct, almost like it's a foreign language to them. They won't understand mercy, but they will want wicked justice. They will not understand forgiveness. They will rather see vengeance. They don't understand redemption. None of those things are true of them as they're drifting to their sin. But the closer you draw, the nearness you are to your Savior, is more, the more foreign your words will become to the unbelieving world. Let me just say that if If they enjoy the fact that you enjoy their jokes and that they can say something and they know they get a laughter from you without you checking it and addressing it, there's a tremendous loss in this fellowship. There's a tremendous loss in the enjoyment of not only your walk with the Lord, but also your love for God's people. And then the adversary will tempt you more and more to indulge in that type of conversation, that way of life, and that thought pattern more than Christ. He doesn't want you to enjoy worship. He doesn't want you to enjoy being with God's people. He wants the opposite. But notice what he says in verses 11 and 12. For Yahweh, God is a sun and a shield. This is the aspect of trusting him, dear saints. There's a prayer to God, but wanting to be with God's people than, than with the wicked. That's those who trust in him have that desire but he says, no good thing in verse 11 does he withhold from those who walk blamelessly. So the psalmist makes a connection between the way that you live and what God does in response. Now, this is not meritorious. This is not earning salvation. But there's something to be said about a life that pursues godliness because godliness pleases the Father. Godliness is not a way to heaven. Living holy is not the reason to heaven. You're not going to heaven because you're living holy. You're living holy because you are going to heaven. Holy living is the result of God's grace and salvation. It is a result of salvation. It is the fruit of salvation. It is not the root of salvation. In fact, righteous living is not even a prerequisite for heaven at all. Because the prerequisite for heaven is the righteousness of Christ for you. God cannot mix your deeds with his son's righteousness to get you to heaven. It's not going to happen. Your eternal security rests solely on Jesus Christ. But the enjoyments of this life on earth in Christ? Yes. There's some enjoyments in Christ that you will not have if you constantly dabble in and out of sin. The richness that the psalmist is expressing here is someone whose walk is consistent day by day, and you enjoy more of this. In fact, your trust in, God's, in God grows more and more, and when your trust in God grows more and more, your confidence in his salvation for you grows. Therefore, there's a correlation between righteous living and comfort, righteous living and assurance of your salvation. And he will not withhold anything good. This good could be sanctification. It could be your encouragement. In other words, whatever you need in this life of God and his God would not withhold from you because he loves to, give, to do good things to his children. He loves to give good gifts to his children. But there's the matter in verse 12 of trust. Here's a, a, another blessedness. How blessed is a man who trusts in you because not everyone does. The grace to believe is a gift. Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, it has been granted to you, right? And this word granted means that it was grace gifted to you, not, not only to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but suffer his sake. The believing and suffering are all gifts. The point is that to trust in Yahweh is a gift. And you're truly blessed that you can believe on him and keep trusting in him. This is not a light matter. What does this trust look like? It looks like I would rather be with God than anyone else. 
is to trust that God will give me what I need. And even if I think I'm lacking something, I trust that what I think I'm lacking, that God has supplied all of my needs in that moment, even though I do not see it. I trust him. What a blessing to be able to say that I trust the Lord. I believe that he's good. I believe that he's merciful. I believe that he's kind. And there's, a, I think, another important distinction to make for the Christian today is that the old covenant believers did not have the joy of God's abiding presence. There was always this anticipation of going to the place of public worship where God's presence will be there, presence will be there. Uh, the Holy Spirit did regenerate them. They received the same gift of life from the Holy Spirit. But the joy of this indwelling presence of Christ was not revealed until Christ ascended and the Holy Spirit came. Now, in salvation, God is with us, but then he is in us. He dwells in us by the Holy Spirit. And because of that, our longing, therefore, for corporate worship, your longing for corporate worship will be the fruit of your fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the week. You not long like the psalmist to be in God's presence because his presence is there only. His presence is with you whether or not you are here. But your longing for fellowship will be the result of the time you spend with Christ throughout the week. Little time, little love. Less time, less affection. The more you grow in devoting yourself to knowing Christ and loving Christ and enjoying the fellowship and salvation is the more that you will enjoy being with God's people because he is there with his people. But to that extent, the longing to be with God's people is a foretaste of the longing to be with Christ and his people in that age of endless and sinless perfection. If you are not pursuing Christ, if you're not growing day by day in Christ's likeness, the Lord's day will feel more like routine than refreshing. You might get something out of it. Service might be okay. Sometimes the service can be rich and profound for someone, just a, just a arid, dry desert for you. Because the heart was not soaking all week in the knowledge and the love of Christ and his word. There's no substitute there for their saints for the discipline of the weekly, Monday to Saturday, fellowship with Christ. This, this great communion, that you have communion with God himself. You, you have fellowship with God himself. There is no fellowship that is even close to, to this glorious communion. And then God invites you to fellowship with him. Here is the supreme creator of all things who does not need you, but because he is glorious and for his glory invites you to share in communion with him, in all of your imperfections, and he robes you with Christ, so he sees his son, he hears you, but he sees his son. What righteousness, what, what goodness, what, what kindness that you can spend time with him. That's incredible. But then, here's Sunday. Sunday service. We're going to have the benediction, hopefully, uh, before midnight. And after the benediction, what next? What next? Dear, dear saints, fan the flames. Stir the longing. Stir the affection. Be intentional. Be prayerful, but be intentional. You, you have to pray and plan. Sanctification is, is not Keswick. It's not going to let God. It's, it's trust God and get going. So you have to be intentional. What will you do after the benediction? Will you focus your thoughts on, on maybe moments of prayer when you get home and in the Word? I love to do that often when I'm done preaching because the sermon oftentimes is a shipwreck. And you have to give the shipwreck to God and say, well, Lord, then he rebukes graciously and shows me that it's not the human instrument, but it's the Word that does the work, right? You, you pour your soul out before him who, who's so sufficient in goodness, so sufficient in kindness. And yes, okay, the preacher, I said something about me. What about you? you? Did you listen to the whole sermon? It was 54 minutes when I started. No, I started 30 seconds late. 
So the sermon's going on 55 minutes. Did you listen to the entire sermon? Here, here God is appealing to you. He's pouring out these truths to your own soul. Did you listen to the whole sermon? Then we, we appeal to his goodness, do we not? Is it not merciful that when the priest was in the temple and he actually did something wrong, you know they had the bell on him, you know what the bell was for? Not that because of lunchtime. When the bell stops ringing, my man is gone. He sinned against God, he's a dead man. What about Uzzah who, who reached out to kind of just help the cart? He didn't even touch right, the ark, he just touched the cart. He reached out to touch the cart and God slew him. He, God took him away, God, yes. He killed him. What mercy that we sit here, we have more than Uzzah did, right? We have much more than they have as far as the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet we still sit through a sermon and we drift. Even the preacher may drift. Yet there's mercy. And we say this is a wonderful opportunity for us to, to remember that our God is good, that he's faithful, that he's kind. And when you get home, you, you begin to intensely meditate on the blessedness of dwelling with God's people, the blessedness of depending on his strength and not your own to worship him, to serve him, to honor him, and then the fact that you can believe in a God that the world continues to deny is a marvelous blessing because at one point in time, you did not trust in him. What a good God. What will your evening be like tonight? Will, will you, before you go to bed, review the day of God's sovereign goodness in the midst of your sins? And then when you wake up tomorrow, will you consider the blessedness that the day before that he spoke to you from his word and it was an act of his goodness because you weren't always receptive or always attentive, but he was always faithful and always good. For two is this the same wash, rinse, and repeat under the great blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior. How blessed it is to know God through Jesus Christ. Let us pray. And Father, we look to you. We thank you. We glorify your name for exercising such benevolence to us. that we are, are blessed to dwell in your place of worship, but then we're blessed that you dwell in us. That we're blessed to find that our strength comes from you, the maker in heaven and earth. That, that you are a rock. That you sustain us. You uphold us. And then, oh, what a blessing it is to be able to say, yes, we, we, we trust in you. And we can say from time to time, and maybe more often than we would admit, I believe, but help my unbelief. Help me in the midst of my doubt, in the midst of, of life's dark shadows, in the midst of, of my lack of commitment to you. May I trust that it is not in myself that you called me, but you called me because you loved me before the foundation of the world and you sent Christ to atone for my sin and my guilt and my death so that you may satisfy your justice rightfully so because your justice is righteous but then exercise a justifying goodness and a grace in declaring the guilty righteous. And then in that declaration, you move on to robe us with the righteousness of your son. You go from declaration to imputation of the righteousness of your son on us and our sins on your son. And then from imputation to salvation with all the benefits of the spirits and dwelling and conversion and sanctification and in the future glorification. What a marvel. What a grace, what goodness that flows from a God 
whose love is infinite and his mercy undeserving. May we rejoice today and the rest of the week and every day of our lives as we consider what the psalmist says, that it is best to be in your presence uh, than in the tent of wickedness, even if it produces a measure of success, we would rather trade in that success as Moses did. Rather, he, did, he desired to suffer with the people of God than to endure the pleasure of sins for a season. He didn't want to enjoy the pleasure of sin. He wanted to enjoy the benefits of trusting you. Oh, God of heaven, thank you so much for revealing your word to us. Stir our hearts, our affections for you. And then I pray for this precious congregation that uh, you will bless and sustain it. Or that they will understand my deep love for them. And that my concern will never go. And that you'll be merciful to them. And that uh, you will help them to, to bring their emotions in check and bring the truth to the front and center stage of this circumstance. And that they will not be guided by feelings but by truth and faith. Pray that their words will be truthful and not slanderous, that there will not be gossip or, or, Lord, misrepresentations of what is happening, that there will be truth on, on every level, and a, a level of sincerity and honesty that is trustworthy. Help us to remember that we must be Christians in the times when it's, it's most difficult to be one. Uh, for trials, Lord, in life, it reveals whether or not we're truly in you, and they also refine our Christian character. For anyone can profess faith when things are well, uh, but Lord, the, your, revening, your refining trials have a way of vetting out, Lord, the fakes and the hypocrites and, and really exposing those who truly love Christ. I pray that there will be a, a sense of unity uh, and, and strength as they, they rely on your power and your Holy Spirit to do what is best in this local fellowship. That they will remember that, that Christ you are building your church and the gates of Hades will never prevail against it. And that this fellowship was not based on the words of men, but the words of God. And it is not sustained by the preaching or the eloquence of a man, but it's sustained by the supreme ruling Savior uh, that scripture says in Ephesians chapter 2 that he himself alone is the head of the church. He is the church's ruler. Not only is he the church's source of life, instruction, not only does he sustain the church, but there's a sovereign ruler and there is only one. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. Sanctify this precious people. Satisfy them in your will. Fortify their thoughts. Help them to bring every thought captive to a big Christ. Uh, let's never be devoted to emotion, but be devoted to truth. Let us be devoted to the gospel, not gossip. Let us go from strength to strength by your spirit. Let us be eager to maintain the unity and the bond of peace. Let us, Lord, by the grace of God, stand fast, united together for the sake of the gospel, not being alarmed by our opponents, because it is true. The opposition is great, and as we sang that song, there's none is equal but our Savior who conquered the adversary, but may we not give any place to him, give him any access. But even as we act as men and be strong, that all that we do be done in love. 